Thank you, Yana, for appearing with us. In your case, it's a reappearance because we had the pleasure of hosting you for a webinar not so, so long ago, and it was just outstanding. Um, all the more reason we're happy to have you back. This is very much a French-American week. Emmanuel Macron is in America. Uh, he left Paris to be here, and here you are sitting in Paris with us here in America, so um, good all around. Um, a few words about Jana. She started life in Latvia, uh, lived there as a young girl where Russian was uh, a language that she absorbed and maintains to this day. She's also lived in Israel and she's a Hebrew speaker as well. Her English, as you'll hear, is fluent. She works and lives in French day by day by day. So she's a very talented scholar indeed, linguistically and otherwise too. Her work focuses especially on discourse analysis, particularly on propaganda as it's made manifest by the media in Western democratic countries. And more and more, she's taking a good hard look at anti-Semitism. France is the country in Western Europe with the largest Jewish population. It's also been the country in Western Europe with the most incidents of anti-Semitism. And Jan is one of the people keeping a close look on those developments. She teaches as a senior lecturer at the Sorbonne Nouvelle, um, where she offers a number of courses in her special area of interest and expertise. She also directs research uh, on new radical discourses together with others and speaks regularly to groups in France and elsewhere about radicalized youth and related subjects. She has a forthcoming book on propaganda, which will offer a detailed analysis of contemporary propaganda methods. And we now turn over to you, Jana, where you can apply some of your knowledge specifically to developments in today's France affecting Jews. Thank you very much, Elvin, for this presentation. And thank you very much for your invitation. You have become a dear friend, just as Gunther, and I'm very happy to talk for you and for our participants. So it's a really great honor and pleasure for me to be here. So today I will start the presentation with four different events that took place in France and in Israel. And uh, that will clarify the title of my conference. Uh, another thing that I wanted to say before to start that today I'll be inspired by an intellectual influence of uh, Daniel Sibouni. Daniel Sibouni is a French researcher. Actually, he's a professor of mathematics. He's a psych psychoanalyst, philosopher, and especially specialist of, uh, of Jewish and Arabic texts. So there will be two books that I uh, that are not translated into English, unfortunately. I will try to, uh, Gunther, can I share the screen for the books? Okay. Um, I, I will show you two books that inspired me uh, particularly, so I can do that. I don't know why. Uh, Gunther, I think you have to some yeah. way. You should, yes, once, oh yes, I see, sorry. Now you should be able to do it, sorry. Okay, thank you. So, uh, here we are, and here are the books of Danielle Sibouni to present, and that inspired this. The one of them is called, uh, well, actually I translated the title because it is not translated into French, Common Bible in Questions and Answers. And the other book that was written in 2003, uh, is a, a Middle East psychoanalysis of a conflict. So these two books that you probably don't know if you haven't read them in French will be a guiding line for my talk today. Well, well, let's start with the events that I would like to present here. The first event I was talking about that last year, so I'm very sorry to repeat that, but I will propose a new analysis 
I, it happened on July 16th in 2012. It was after the uh, terrorist attack committed by Mohamed Mira. And the uh, newspaper Liberation published the dialogue between him uh, and the military negotiator, uh, and where Mohamed Mira explains his actions. And actually, what is interesting, it's uh, what he said. Well, here is the text. Um, he said, this, this is an extract from his speech. He said, I would never have killed children if you had, if you had not killed our children. <clears throat> I killed Jewish children because my little sisters, my little Muslim brothers are being killed. So I knew that if I only killed soldiers, Jews, all that, the message would get across better. Because if I would have killed civilians, the French population, would have said that I'm his crazy Al-Qaeda guy. He's just a terrorist. He kills civilians. Even if I have the right, but the message is different. Here I killed soldiers and Jews. I will get back to this text later. That is the first event. The second event, it happened in June uh, last year, but this year actually, on uh, 2022, the weekly newspaper Le Pignon publishes an article, what's in French, on the epidemic of Islamic dress in France, in French national education system. The article points out the significant increase of um, high school students who defy the Republican law, and um, they come to school with the ostentatious wearing of religious signs. You probably know that France is a secular republic, and secularism in France means that the state and all the religious uh, organizations are separated. And those who work in the uh, state uh, organisms are, uh, have to be neutral. They don't have to show any religious sign. And it's forbidden in school, in French public school, to wear religious signs. So what happened? It was the sort of uh, Islamic revolution. And many, many uh, high school uh, kids came with the ostentatious wearing, uh, Islamic wearing. They are, these are called abaya and kami. Those are loose-fitting men's tunic, full-body dresses, a sort of uh, outfits that are worn by followers of rigorist Islam. And the author of this article notes that while some schools prohibit such dress practices, others turn a blind eye on this phenomenon by letting it happen and hiding behind the freedom to dress as one wishes and saying that they have difficulty of interpreting such dress. Another third event, it's a series of events, and also happened in, in May uh, 2022. There was a military doctor, uh, Alban Gervais. He was not Jewish. He was a military doctor who uh, uh, actually uh, worked in Marseille, had his throat cut in front of his children, uh, in front of the Catholic school, picking them up in Marseille. A certain Mohammed El, we don't know his name, cut his throat, which is a sacrificial gesture, while shouting Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest. And what is interesting that the press didn't talk much about it. Or if they talked about that, they said that Alban Gervais was killed as if the killing happened by itself. There was no agent, semantic agent of the killing. Later on, we had articles in the press where the uh, media said that his murderer was mentally disturbed. Another event, the same May 2022, it was an old Jewish man, René Hajaj. He was found dead at the foot of his building in Lyon, and he was defenestrated by his uh, neighbor, a certain Rashid Kenish, who was supposedly mentally disturbed. Rashid Kenish tweeted a lot on Twitter, and the reading of his tweets does not allow to affirm that it is someone who would act in the name of Allah, as it was the case of Traoré Kobili, the murderer of Sarah Halimi. I will get back to that. But what is curious in this madness, like that of the other mentally disturbed and deranged people who have attacked Jews, it is crossed by strong anti-Semitic motives. Almost at the same time, another event took place. Here is the, uh, the article about Rene Hajjaj. And here is another event that took place in Israel this time in, at the Academy of Fine Arts in Jerusalem in Betalel. <clears throat> An Arab student 
who actively supported the jihadist attacks on the last week of May 2022 in Israel by posting texts praising the Shahid's martyrs, was excluded for 15 days from the institution as a punishment. His exclusion provoked the wrath of his Arab classmates, but also of some Jewish students. One of his Jewish professors asked for help from NGO Breaking Silence to find a good lawyer for this Arab student. The Jewish and Arab students even organized a fund so that the glorifier of the terrorists returns to the university as soon as possible. So he returned to the university after 15 days of exclusion. The Arab students then organized a demonstration in the Academy of Fine Arts shouting, Israel is a terrorist state. Some Jewish students uh, st said they were afraid to be in the same class with a terrorist supporter because he openly applauded the killing of Jews. Others, quite few, protested from his return uh, to the faculty. One Jewish student, Anger, Upon seeing the glorifier of the of a murderer sitting there, as it happened, spilled his cup of coffee up. He was immediately expelled from the Academy of Fine Art until the end of the semester. The management of this academy considers till today his long-term exclusion, which is likely to satisfy the demand of Arab students. So there are four events that happened. At first glance, one doesn't see a connection between what I'm describing here, because these events didn't take place in the same place nor at the same time. However, if we put it and if we carry out this reflection, not in the immediacy of the social, political, and ideo ideological reality that concerns France and Israel, we're trying to understand how all these events are in one way or another linked to the problems of their origins historical, symbolic, cultural, religious, perhaps we can grasp the link between these facts and understand their dynamics. Even if the murder of Toulouse took place 12 years ago, the terrorist threat of this magnitude is not zero in France. Well, all conflicts between religions, cultures, and ways of life, ways of life they always have multifactorial multi explanations. And every single parameter is sufficient to grasp the phenomenon of adversity and hatred. Sociological, historical, political, and geographical approaches can contribute to thinking this phenomena. I will help myself today with Daniel Siboni's point of view because he takes into account the unconscious and the symbolic, everything that founds the identity of the individual and collective subject without this subject always being aware of it. So let's go back to the events. First of all, Mohammed Mirai and his death. Um, you will probably put his text back here to, to see it again, because it's an interesting text, an interesting uh, explanation. Well, when you look at it, you see that he is clear on two things. The killing of Jews is better than the killing of the others, Jews and soldiers. He also says he has a right to do so, which presupposes that killing of Jews is lawful. Well, when you look at the text, you see that he equates military and Jews because military and Jew, in his mind, both possess the negative semantics, evil, but also those who attack the Ummah. Ummah is a Muslim community, the infidels in the active way. Mira identifies French Jews with the Jewish people who, according to him, would not behave well in Israel. Siboni reminds us in all his works that the sovereign existence of the Jewish people is the object of Islamic vindictiveness. In the land of Islam, the Jews were considered dhimi, a despicable and defenseless minority, cursed by Allah and associated with apes and pigs, Surah number five, verses 59 and 60. Jewish people are to be, is to be destroyed, Surah 46, verses 34 and 35. Just an example. Mohammed Mirai is of an Algerian origin. He grew up in a family very much influenced by Islam, also marked by hatred of Jews. When showing that Jews are bad, are as bad as Quran says, actually when he said that he has a right to kill Jews, he is referring to what is said in the Quran, Jews are bad and cursed by Allah. But we don't like to talk about these things in France because it is not well seen here to talk about the origins. 
It is contrary to the universal democratic idea that puts all people on equal footing, whatever their origin is. Now I'm coming back to another murder. When the Chechen Muslim Abdullah Anzorov cut the throat of Samuel Petit, we are quite used in France to cutting throats. Uh, Samuel Petit was a teacher in a college and uh, he showed the caricatures of the prophet. So, advanced uh, by another Muslim, Abdullah Anzorov, we had anthropologists and philosophers in France who justified his act by searching for meaning. And they are not, not wrong, but their analysis doesn't go too very far because Anzorov, the killer, didn't, did indeed give the meaning to his life uh, by going to look for it in the fundamental text in Quran, which uh, has the function precisely of giving meaning to the lives of men. In an experimental uh, anthropologist, uh, Alain Berthaud, didn't hesitate to write that Samuel's petit killer, Abdullah Anzorov, is an uprooted person who gave meaning to his own life because he was, in short, lost and desperate in France. The murder thus becomes the existential quest of a lost man, not a word about his culture, not a word about his education or his religion. The university anthropologist only knows what he read in the media about this man. And the real culprit in this tragedy, according to the anthropologist, is, I quote, a poor police judgment. I will go further than Berthaud, and I will say that it's rather the state's assessment that is faulty. The absence of questioning of the motives that give meaning to the lives of Islamists is a failure of the state apparatus in Europe. And zero fate so he finds the meaning that is inscribed in the text, and the state has little, if any, for these ways of giving meaning to life, although these attempts have become numerous in France. If one adopts this logic, the fact remains that it is a justification for the act of killing. Despite the existential conjunctures of some compassionate ex exegetes, it is reasonable to think that the killer didn't did it not in the same of some esoteric meaning, but in the name of Islam, according to the law of Sharia, which forbids a uh, mocking religion. Samuel Petit broke this law by showing caricatures of the prophet. This teacher thought he lived in France under French and didn't think he was breaking it, but he was executed under Sharia law, the Sharia law forbids any criticism of Islam, especially by non-Muslims. Actually, it's possible to say that to say that Islam includes Sharia and Jihad is criticism. So the idea of questioning the conviction of which Mirachi brothers, the killers of uh, Charlie Hebdo and Zorov and commit their acts is not conceivable because it is considered to be Islamophobic. Daniel Sibouni, takes this word in its etymological sense, showing that French and European is really Islamophobic. I quote, the fear of Islam that inhabits the European establishment is the fear of the fanatical in which the claims of the sacred is embodied. The Islamophobia of the establishment goes hand in hand with the mode of operation of the French law. Well, I tried to translate for you what he says here, because it's an interesting uh, uh, explanation or what I found it here, maybe. Okay. Maybe not, maybe later. Okay, maybe later, sorry. So I, I read it. The power the governments in each country of Europe is thus stuck by an Islamic pressure, which it is afraid of, but which it denounces because it is afraid of it. The establishment names it Islamophobia, and it is classified in the phobias that the establishment is ashamed to feel. These phobias are not to be questioned. This vision confirms the establishment in its phobic posture, where the strongest pretends to be to forget his strength, the strength of the law, and behaves as a weak, except in words. So all this generates paradoxes that Sibuni describes very well. Let's say anti-Semitism is a mortal sin. The risk of stigmatizing Islam is another mortal sin in Europe. Jews are attacked by Muslims, but one cannot, will not criticize Muslims when one says that they are raised in the anti-Jewish syndrome. And Europeans who try to justify Mirah 
as acting against Israel and not against Jews are belied by Mirah himself. Killing Jews here to avenge Israel means that Mira is more lucid than our beautiful souls in Europe. For him, the Jews are a people that Allah has cursed. He says to the military negotiator, even if I have the right to kill them. This right, his right, is one that he arrogates to himself, is written in the text of Quran. To deny that this vindictiveness exists against the people of the book is to ignore one of the sources of the double discourse that prevails in relations between Islam and the West, a double discourse that is obligatory but very well tolerated in the Arab countries themselves. It's enough to listen carefully to the people of Hamas who never cease to recall the Quranic vindictiveness. And here is a, uh, I hope it will work. And here is what uh, one of the uh, deputies of Hamas, Yunis Alastal, says until 2020. Well, you can see that he actually refers to Quran. There is no doubt that by occupying this land, the Jews have filled it with corruption because Allah has described them in these terms. Whenever they light the fire of war, Allah puts it out. They strive to spread corruption on the earth. Allah said that they are the worst living creatures in the, in the sight of Allah, and then they are the strongest in enmity against the believers. So the Israel is thus the revelation of this very old hatred. The political establishment in Europe constantly says no stigmatization. But if you look at the text of the Quran, you will find that the others, all the others are stigmatized, but nobody looks at the text. Why not? Because people here are afraid of being labeled Islamophobic or extreme right wing. They are afraid for their own image. The uh, law is thus denied in favor of what I call masochistic narcissism. Defying the law that forbids the veil in a secular school is a challenge to the country's way of life. It is also a phenomenon linked to the mode of being of Islam. Sivuni says, Europe will find it difficult to cope without changing its relationship with its principles to face a situation totally unprecedented in history. Thing indicates that it will make itself sick and even die gently out of charity towards the other with a deep understanding, vaguely Christic, like crazy. They don't know what they're doing. We must understand them, better respond to their needs. In short, Europe is afraid, moderate Muslims are afraid, and Islamists of all stripes are only trying to scare. This is a business that works, and that's what we observe in the history of the whale is the burial of the law. And one could add that this case works because the burial of the law doesn't exist, which makes useless the measures of the French government training to secularism courses for secularism for the imams and different people who work with the Muslims doesn't work because secularism is not only the freedom to believe or not to believe, it is above all the protection of the public space uh, against the encroachment of religions or aggressive ideologies. If this condition is not respected by those who are supposed to embody the law because they are afraid, it goes without saying that a great breach is opened for the conquest of the public space by the Islamic identity in Europe. I'm coming to the uh, other series of events of the cutting throats and defenestration by mentally disturbed. Well, as you probably all know, the tone was set in 2017 by Kobeli Traoré. You've spoken a lot about that. The, uh, the guy who defenestrated Sarah Halimi and he was considered legally responsible and his uh, gesture was accompanied by the traditional Allah bar. So we had psychiatric ex expertise, judgment of the magistrates as to the mental health and therefore the criminal responsibility do not allow to see the origins of this identity-based hatred. It's a thousand year old hatred that has existed in Arab lands since the Quran has written, uh, was written and that is the main vector of this attacks. It may very well be that all those who are declared by the media and the courts to be mentally disturbed. It's, it, it's absolutely clear that may be not normal. So it's legitimate to us what is this madness, which is directed particularly towards the Jews, and if one can be in a normal state when one kills in the name of his God? To these questions, Daniel Sibuni proposes also an interesting analysis. Well, he was talking about madmen who were sniffing cannabis 
So sniffing cannabis is also sniffing the calls of the Quran and the explanations of imams because they uh, go to mosques and the imams officiate in these mosques. And so actually they commit not a mad act, but a pious act. Kobili Traoré has prepared his act. He was talking about that. Rashid Kenish, who defenestrated an old man in May of this year, made tweets against Jews and Israel before throwing his neighbor out of the window. Uh, on Mohammed, who murdered Alban Gervais, a military French doctor in Marseille, in front of his children, the media said he showed signs of mental disturbance, confusing God and devil in his discourses. The only thing we know that he shouted Allah Akbar and he explicitly cut Alban Gervais, uh, Alban Gervais' throat. This Mohammed was known to the police as a drug trafficker. Whether it could be literary or Mohammed L, the killer of Alban Gervais, this man committed pious acts in the name of their God. Daniel Sibuni questions this madness and uses the word pious to characterize these acts, noting that this may seem incongruous to secular judges who prefer to replace it with mad. To speak of the act committed in the name of a religion doesn't fit with the justice of the secular country, which is France. Murders in the name of God began in France with the, uh, the one of Sebastian Salam in 2003. He was Jewish. His killer, Adela Mastaibu, found not criminally responsible because mentally disturbed, explained that after killing a Jew, he would go to heaven. So if these people are declared in, we should perhaps ask ourselves about the origin of this infinity, um, which is quite common. And yet this madness is, is written in the text, that of Quran. Nobody wants to go and look closely at the text, but this madness is exposed in many surahs. I'll give you a proof. The proof is that when an Israel, Israeli Jew is stabbed in the name of Allah, with the cry, Allah Akbar, nobody talks about mentally disturbed or responsible, fruited, lost and desperate youngsters searching the sense of their life. In Israel, they talk about terrorists, and in Europe, very often about Palestinian resistance fight, even though the mode of are dictated by the same vindictiveness. As you saw when we uh, read together the uh, discourse of uh, the Hamas deputy. But Europe prefers not to see this pleading, the anti-colonial struggle in Israel, which justifies the jihad or the same madness that they refuse to see and understand on their own soil. Sibuni, who lived in Morocco within the Muslim culture, explains this like that. The deep level of the problem is the gap between the two cultures. A statement like Jews are monkeys and Christians are pigs, or we have to fight them to the end, sounds a bit crazy to the Western ears, but it is very acceptable and well held in the Islamic space. This does not mean that subjects are anti-Semitic in our sense of the word in, West, in the Western sense. They can be very friendly and convivial. It was the case of um, uh, the killer of uh, an old, old Jewish man. But for various reasons, the sacred call imposes itself itself on them at the time when they want to give more meaning to their life and bring it closer to the sacred, they can put it into action. This is why the friendliness of Rashid Kenish, who received uh, uh, Uncle René, the old Jewish man at his home, is not contradictory with the very ancient calls that he was able to incorporate. In analyzing the refusal of justice to address the connection of madness and religion in the case of the murders, Sibuni notes, the judges who refuse the, the trial have good intentions. Above all, not to let it be said that said, such acts have anything to do with Islam. The message is well passed. Everyone knows that this relationship is close, but it should not be said. And now with these acts, we have gone to the next level. Given that the relationship with Islam is too clear for everybody, we must not let it be said that the discourse of the killers who quote the sacred text almost to the letter is a religious discourse. It can only be psychotic. Otherwise, it's a whole religion that would be pointed out as a little crazy, especially when it wants to settle in a culture that it itself contests without having the means to erase it and that it cannot submit. Well, I remind that since 2000, 
13 Jews have been killed in France. I'm looking at Gunther and I'm remembering that many years ago, many years, some years ago, I came to Berlin. I said there were 11 Jews that were killed because they were Jews and now we've got 13 and many others because they were non-Muslims. These murders were committed in the name of Allah, in the name of the call that is inscribed in the fundamental text. It should be noted that there is no case in France where a Jew or a Christian or an atheist or an agnostic or whoever else would attack Muslims or anyone else. Jews don't suffer from this identity-based hatred. It's not part of their identity. It is not written in the text and it is not interesting for the existence. The vast majority of Christians have come to terms with it after having reviewed their reading of the text. Hatred is a strong possessive passion. It prevents one from living. Our experts here have no idea of the hatred whose object is the very existence of the other. But the Quranic discourse is pronounced several times a day, and even one doesn't listen to it attentively, who doesn't know the Quran, it runs through the identity uh, of those who claim to be part of this culture. You have to really read Quran to understand how Jews and Christians are portrayed in it, and also to understand that this book is very present, very dynamic, that the lives of Muslims are closely linked in the text with the lives of the Jews, who are considered to be the cursed of Allah, the Suras of the Quran, are full of condemnations of the Jews, who are considered as those who have perverted the word of Allah and as such deserve punishment. And those who do so are only applying to the latter, the vindictiveness written in the text that legitimizes their roots. So they're not uprooted, all the contrary. Indeed, if one does not want to talk about these roots, it is because one considers that they may be dangerous or that it may involve violence towards the others and maybe even challenge the idea that Islam is the religion of peace and love. Well, fourth event, that's what I call the perverse uh, montage. Um, I'm explaining myself. I'm speaking about Bethlehem now. We are going to Israel. This is the fourth event. It has to challenge Europeans because it is a fanatical form of the denial that Europe hides under the cloak of Islamic correctness. In the Academy of Fine Arts, Betzalel in Jerusalem, we're dealing with two types of fanatics, jihad fanatics and Jewish fanatics who turn against their own, the management fanatics of the establishment. The Jewish fanatics blame the Jews for resisting attempts to annihilate the Jewish people in the name of Allah, for not tolerating calls to kill their own people. The Jewish student didn't want to share the same space with the one who applauded the murders of the Jews publicly, fearing for his life and the life of his fellow students. And he was considered guilty for not wanting to support the cause for the murder of his people. He had to expiate his fault by being removed from the university. Until today, we don't know what happened with this guy, if he has a right to study or not. Betzalel's managers are exactly part of this perverse European style setup, enhanced by the moral narcissism that characterizes the Israeli left. Let's analyze what's going on here. The Arab student vigorously and openly supports the terrorists and the murders of the Jews, therefore also of his classmates, because they are Jews also. But since, since he has not yet killed anyone, the classmates shouldn't feel attacked and affected. The managers of Betzalel go further than anti the anti-Zionists. They consider that the Arab student expresses his opinion and he has the right to do so. A Jewish student commits an unbearable act of violence. He knocks over the coffee cup of the man who rejoices in the murder of the Jews. The inc incident is filmed and you, you have a link to it. The Arab student is provoked by the Jew who doesn't want to share the same space with the man who desires to execute some Jews on the name of Allah. And he doesn't know if one day or another, he will not be tempted to do the same in the classroom. So uh, the cause of his gesture is forgotten. And it is considered that this Jewish student has committed an aggression. This aggression deserves an exemplary punishment. As a result, the Muslim student would be a free thinker and the other, the Jewish student is a racist. I call it a doxical sophism. The logic of inversion, masochistic and perverse at the same time exceeds even the European perversion because it incites the free thinker to more expression of his thought and intimidates by punitive measures, 
those who want to contest it. The spilling of a cup of coffee is an unbearable offense that touches the very identity of the Muslim student. It must be punished in an exemplary and lasting way. A Jew does not attack the one who incites to kill him. As long as he is not killed, he is the strongest, and the strongest must endure that the weakest wants him dead. The Jewish student is thus sacrificed to the perversion of humanitarianism. Uh, here we see the cup of coffee that flies away, but we do not see the bodies of Israelis who died during the last collective violence, not the mourning of their families. The exclusion of the Jewish students by Israeli officials is also part of the fact that Israeli left is, has integrated the Christian mental patterns that are enforced in Europe today. Everything for the other, even if it means being anti-Jewish by humanism. And these speeches uh, were heard during the trial of Salah Abdel Slam, was the organizer of Bataclan killing. It allows us to observe this evangelism at work. Um, I quote the words of Abdel Slam's lawyer, Olivia Renan, which seems to be inspired by the words of St. Matthew of St. John. She says, it seems that punishment is meant to make the punisher better. So when you think about your decision, what is the punishment of Abdel Islam? I ask you to make the effort and to ask yourself this question, will the punishment you're about to pronounce make us better? Compare this with the words of the evangelist, Matthew, blessed are the merciful for they shall, shall obtain mercy, St. John. When they continued to question him, he straightened up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at you. This deliberate ignorance, or rather the denial of Quranic vindictiveness, the forgetfulness of the actors of the trial, this particular trial, to look into the roots, identity, religion, and culture of the murderers, nourish the deep misunderstanding, which contrary to Olivia Renan, the lawyer of Abdel Islam, uh, will not allow to avoid the repetition of this act. Now I'm coming to the conclusion. So in other words, um, you know, that uh, I didn't quote here of Daniel Sibuni, particularly his book, not translated into English, Three Monotheistic Religions, Trois Monotheism. Um, he says, the origin of hatred is the hatred of the origin. I think it's a very deep phrase. It's perhaps around this remark that we should build analytical reasoning on the tensions that the West is experiencing today with Islam. It is not by replacing self-hatred with love or the other a masochistic variant that we see at work in Europe and in Israel that this tension can be resolved, but by patient questioning of the origin, origins and their flaws that will allow us to be neither in submission no, of the other to the other, nor in its exclusion. Thank you very much.